Hello everybody, my name is Matt and I'm with Scope Education. Now I hate it when people spend four minutes in every video trying to promote their own content, but we're not only on YouTube, we also have a Facebook, Twitter, and our own website. Feel free to like us or follow us there if you want weekly medical blog posts. In this short video, we're going to be going over some narrow complex tachycardias and how to treat them. So let's get on with the video. So here's a list of some narrow complex tachycardias that you should be familiar with. If you want to review the whole list, we made an ECG review guide for pretty much every rhythm you can even imagine. That link is gonna be down in the description for you guys to check it out. So you have your sinus tack, you guys got your atrial flutter, your AFib with RVR, your MAT, no, not me, your multifocal atrial tachycardia, and your SVT. Now you guys out there need to know that SVT is an umbrella term that encompasses a bunch of different rhythms. And we'll kind of get into that a little bit later in the SVT slide. So here is our sinus tack, it's the most common rhythm. Uh, we should see it a ton. Now the general rule of thumb for sinus tachycardia is 220 minus the patient's age. So that's a good way to figure out if it is sinus tack or it might be another kind of rhythm. On a 12 week this will be a regular narrow complex, unless you have some aberrancy like a bundle branch block, with a rate over 100 and it will be a 1 to 1 P to QRS ratio. You can see that in the strip I have below with a P QRS P QRS. To treat this rhythm, you need to figure out the root cause. You know, is it anxiety? Is it because they're short of breath, a little dyspnea? Is it because they have shock? Just treat the underlying issues and you'll inherently fix the sinus tack. Now, when it comes to looking at atrial activity, can anyone guess what the best lead would be? Would be lead two? Well, actually, it's gonna be V1. V1 is gonna be your money lead. It's gonna be your money lead because of where it sits over the heart. It should be right over the SA node. Now this isn't a hundred percenter, so always check the whole 12 lead for atrial activity or your P waves, but always look in V1 first if you're having any issues and trying to pick it up because of where it is placed. You're gonna be talking about atrial flutter. I already made a video on atrial flutter and how to find hidden flutter waves, so I won't go too in depth with this. This is a re-entry circuit that happens inside the right atrium. So basically the current just keeps going around and around in a circle and the atrial rate is usually 250 to 300 beats per minute. If you see atrial activity at a rate of 300 or more, or basically one quote unquote P wave every one large box, it is going to be flutter. Only flutter can do that. If you slam these patients with some adenosine, all it does is temporarily interrupts the conduction to the ventricles. It'll slow down the rhythm for you to see the flutter waves easier, but it won't really fix the flutter. Also, flutter has different conduction ratios. You get your 1 to 1, 2 to 1, 3 to 1, 20 to 1, 40 to 1. It doesn't matter. Or a variable one, so it can have a mixture of the 2 to 3 to 4 to 1 conduction ratio, and that makes it irregular. Your treatments for atrial flutter are going to include your vagal maneuvers, your beta blockers, calcium channel blockers. In my experience, I've noticed that flutter is super easy to convert even without medications or vagal maneuvers or anything like that. I somebody showed a patient in an IV one time and it scared the rhythm away. And if you look over to the right, you can see the beautiful flutter waves. I know this is not a tacky flutter, but I wanted to show you guys how to easily see the flutter waves. And as I said before in a couple slides ago, if you thought this section was too easy on atrial flutter, make sure you check out the hidden flutter waves video to learn more. And remember that V1 is still your money lead. So here we have our AFib with RVR, which is the normal science rhythm of the state of Florida. We've all seen AFib, everyone has it. This is an irregularly irregular rhythm with no discernible P waves. Early onset AFib has more of a coarse fibrillatory wave so you can actually see them. Um, and as time goes on and on, they're gonna become more fine until you can't really see them at all. Now one thing to keep in mind with AFib is that the rate never really gets over 170, 180, right? If you think of all your patients that have been in AFib with RVR, has it really gotten anything over that? I, I can't really think of any. Now if you see an irregularly irregular rhythm at a rate of 200 plus, and you start thinking about some pre-excitation uh, such as Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome. We conveniently also have a video on that as well, so if you want information on that, go ahead and check that out. AFib is a very fluid sensitive rhythm. You and I usually walk around with one or two liters down of water every day. AFib is basically the top part of the heart, which is called the atrium, is basically not contracting like a normal heart would be. It is fibrillating or basically just quivering. This causes these patients to kind of lose their atrial kick. So when you combine loss of atrial kick, due to the AFib and dehydration, you're gonna get some AFib with RVR. So listen to your lung sounds, 
And if they're clear, try to give these patients some fluids. See if you can help with that atrial kick. As with atrial flutter, the treatments are pretty much the same. You got your beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, cardioversion, etc. Adenosine does the same thing as it did with the atrial flutter. It slows down the rhythm and you can basically see more filibatory ways, but it doesn't actually convert these patients. Now remember, before you lay up this patient, please remember that not only is electrocardioversion kind of difficult to do with these patients, and also remember that their atriums are fibrillating, right? Which means that there's a chance that there could be a clot inside of the right atrium, and when you convert that rhythm, you can just launch it from the atrium into the lungs or brain, which is gonna be causing some worse scenarios, like you know your PE or stroke or something like that. So make sure you do some, some tests, a thorough history, that kind of stuff before you try to break AFib and try to think about some underlying causes. Think of your fluid administration for these kinds of patients. Here's your multifocal atrial tachycardia, or MAT. This is an irregularly irregular tachycardic rhythm with a P wave node before every QRS. But remember there need with this, there needs to be three different types of P wave morphologies, which you can see over here on the uh, picture I have on the right. Luckily for us, this is not a super common rhythm. It was kind of back in the day. It's usually associated with some kind of pulmonary issues or when back in the day when the patients were given theophylline. Luckily, we don't see that very often. And you treat this very similar to sinus tachycardia. You kind of fix the underlying issues and that usually fixes the MAT. Now into SVT. For ER or pre-hospital, we don't really have to worry about figuring out what specific rhythm it is. So we'll just call any rhythm that is above the ventricles SVT. That's what you get the supraventricular part means, above ventricles. Here's a list of all of them. You can see in the first part right here. Interestingly enough, I love cardiology and electrophysiology, and I have been just absolutely blessed with this awesome heart condition that caused my heart rate to just skyrocket to 150 to 200 beats per minute when it really just feels like it. It's called inappropriate sinus tack. It's a type of SVT. I have a video of me vagling myself out for you guys. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, but like I said, SVT is just an umbrella term that we are lucky enough to use because we don't actually have to determine the specific rhythm most of the time. That is the problem of the electrophysiologist. But here are your normal treatments. You got your vagal maneuvers, your cardioversions, adenosine, beta blockers, or calcium channel blockers. So here, so we've all heard of multiple types of vagal maneuvers, right? A lot of them don't have high success rates, but one I've been using a lot and did research on is the modified Valsalva maneuver. It's got a 43% success rate, so obviously not very high, but it's a lot higher than 10%, right? So to do this is you gotta just have the patient sit in the semi-recumbent uh, semi position. They blow into a syringe for about 15 seconds, and then you put them in a supine position and you lift their legs for 45 seconds. And that's pretty much it. It's not that difficult, right? So I'll actually show you guys a video on how to do it. I'm Andy Applebaum. I'm uh, the chief investigator for the REVERT study. Um, I'm also a consultant at the Royal Devon and Exeter Hospital in the southwest of England. Hello. Um, I see from your heart tracing that you've got a condition called SVT. The REVERT trial was a randomised controlled trial to look at a method of modifying the Valsalva manoeuvre for the treatment of SVT. So um, asked you just to get a good seal around that with your mouth and blow hard enough to make the needle reach. The modification was designed to increase venous return during the relaxation phase of the manoeuvre and involve laying the patient flat and lifting the legs in the air at the end of the strain phase. Overall, uh, we found that patients that were randomised to the standard manoeuvre, only 17% of patients were cardioverted to sinus rhythm, whereas for the modified technique, 43% of patients uh, returned to sinus rhythm. It really does demonstrate marked improvement with, uh, with the modified technique. Uh, and I think we should consider using that as a standard approach to the, to the initial treatment of this condition. Five, four, three, two, one, and just completely relax. Lift your legs up in the air. So okay. we used a, a, a blood pressure manometer that was modified for the trial, and, and that can be done in emergency departments, but uh, in other practice or usual practice, uh, a 10 mil syringe blowing just hard enough to start moving the plunger, uh, we believe gives a, a similar sort of pressure. Right. So you ready? Mm -hmm. And ready, steady, blow. 
And the, the benefit of that is that patients can uh, use this at, at home and outside of the hospital because it's a condition that can recur. Um, and that gives the patient some control um, and may mean that patients don't need to come to hospital in the first place. Okay, I'm gonna sit you back up now. All right, guys, thank you so much for watching. I hope you guys enjoyed. Once again, my name is Matt with Scope Education. If you want blog posts, check out our website in the description or follow us on social media. Just remember that medicine's all about baby steps, so take it one step at a time.